Hello, this is the Trudy Haynes Show. Welcome, I'm Trudy, and I hope that you're going to stay with me for the whole show because we have so many things to tell you, and we have a good show, by the way. we got Shamaya Bay, astrologist. We have Hidden Footprints, but first, I have to tell you about some changes that we've made here on Bounce. We are no longer on at 7.30 to 8. Our new time is 5.30 to 6. We're still on Thursdays, but we come on at 5.30 following that WMCN sports reporter. His name is Phil Andrews. Now, he goes 5 to 5.30, and we come on with the Trudy Haynes Show from 5.30 to 6. But the big news is that we're also online on demand on Life and Spirit. We'll be there webcasting on Saturday mornings at 9.30 a.m. So if you miss us probably Thursday, you can see the same show Saturday mornings or vice versa. But be sure to join us on both because the same show, the good show, is going to be there for you. But right now, we're going to get started on this show. And as I told you, Shemaya Bay is going to be here, the astrologer, to tell us what the stars have in store for us for this coming new year or this year that it's already started. And you've heard about Marcus Garvey and Back to Africa. Well, on Hidden Footprints, Kathleen is going to bring you all the news about why he wanted to take us back to, to Africa. So stay with us because we've got lots of celebrities from around the town. And here we go. Okay, okay. Tell me things haven't changed. Here's our guy. Come here. You, in my eyes. Hero. Thank you. You ever do any hunting? What a month January turned out to be with all the celebrities who were in town, like Mark Wahlberg, who was in town to promote his new movie, Broken City. And our Vonda Klein had an opportunity to get up close and personal to ask him about his new movie. You know the great thing about the kind of parts that I choose, I always try to find some sort of thing that I can identify with on a personal level and connect to. Because then I think if you have a part like that, then I think the portrayal is much more authentic. Yes, you know, I, I think I agree. The, the audience can really feel that, that, that understanding. And, you know, with all the bad things that I've gone through in my life and all the real life experience I have, I have the benefit now of using that uh, in my craft. I had a chance to get hugs and kisses from Danny Glover in town as guest speaker at the Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast at Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey. He had some deep thoughts about King and the state of our people today. Well, what, what, what I see is going, are these movements that are talking about, simply about the Occupy movement. Now, if you look at the Occupy movement, they, they de deconstruct the Occupy movements. And you look at all the kind of discussions that were happening. I think we have to kind of reimagine democracy. And what do we see that happening, I think, in a, in a very profound way in, in Latin America? There's a reimagining of democracy in a sense, where pe people from the bottom up become participants in their own rescue and participants in the process. And you are? I am the president of Rowan University. Okay. How did you get Danny Glover? How did I get Danny Glover? Uh, we have an extraordinary team of talented individuals that every year in, in, in preparing for this great event, they start early on and they try to look for individuals that are prominent, that are highly regarded in the world, that have accomplished, that understand, or have had hopefully some association with uh, uh, Martin Luther King. And we have been very, very extraordinarily lucky to be able to get somebody of his stature to come in here. And the man is so wonderful, so open, so kind. And it just, I'm, I'm just so impressed with him. I really am. I loved him. I watched all, many of his movies. But I'm particularly impressed with him, with the character that he is. 
and the knowledge. And yes, yes. <laughs> so, so we are we are so delighted that he, he he could he could come in here, and especially I mean, look at this thing. The man is giving his time, meeting everybody, anybody who came to his desk asking for a photo, an autograph or a picture. He was open, smiled, never felt tired, never felt frustrated. That's a sign of a great man. You are also doing a whole month on black history. What will that entail generally? It will entail various uh, events and celebrations on campus, especially uh, in this building amongst our student organizations. There are movies, there are, there are events, there are speeches, and of course the faculty members in their classes make sure that they, they, they educate students about the, the black, black African American month, and, and, and I think it it's, it's really encompasses all the many, many events on this campus. It's not just one or two events. Okay, and of course some Danny Glover movies. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. You're Congratulations. Welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Also in town recently, the glamorous Mary Wilson, founder of the famous Supreme Singing Group, and the one and only Supreme who stuck with the group from beginning to end. She was guest attraction for the preview of one of the most fabulous exhibits the African American Museum has had to date. Come see about me. Yes, it is fabulous with some 50 or more original gowns worn by all the Supremes, including Mary's own gowns from her personal collection. Folks, don't miss this exhibit, which also points out the history during their time, and it's not to be missed. The Philadelphia chapter of the Lynx is a nonprofit international African American women's organization convened at City Hall recently to make a significant contribution to the Haitian Education Relief Fund in its continuing consciousness of enriching, sustaining, and ensuring the culture and economic survival of people of African ancestry. Lorraine Brown, chairperson, and Mary Houston, president of the world's oldest chapter, presented a check to Carol Stern, president and CEO of UNICEF. Well, that's bouncing Jerry Blavitt on stage, working out with the band for his semi-annual memories salute to the good old days, when groups like the stylistics, the moments, the dramatics were all top of the chart, and singers like Band of Gold Grammy winner Frida Payne, and that recording artist, movie actress, wife to Danny Glover's Lethal Weapons movie, Dolly in Love. And they were all on hand for a one-nighter at the Kimmel Center to a most appreciative audience. We all gathered for pictures and memories at the after party with host Jerry and his entourage and fans who had special invites like our staff to bring you backstage. And it was a great party. Now here's Kathy Lee with Hidden Footprints. She's bringing to life the story about Marcus Garvey the activist who wanted us to go back to Africa. What is a movement? Why do they start and why do they end? Today, we will explore Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa movement. My name is Kathy Lee, and welcome to Hidden Footprints. Garvey was born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica in 1887. As a young man in his 20s, Garvey witnesses firsthand the racism faced by people of color in his travels through Central and South America and also in England and Europe. He was determined to change the world African people were confined to live in. This world was full of economic exploitation, imperialistic European colonialism, and unprecedented racism backed up by science and anthropological studies. But what did Garvey's world look like? 
Garvey saw that the entire world had been carved up, divided, and colonized by European countries in order to reap the benefits of cheap labor and control the resources of these nations. Names of countries and regions were changed to reflect this. This was especially true of the continent of Africa. Garvey asked, and rightly so, two questions. Where is the black man's government? Where is his president, his country, his men of big affairs? He concluded, I could not find them, and he was determined to alter this reality through the establishment of his economic and spiritual Back to Africa movement through his creation of UNIA and the ACL. You see, he decided that it was time to take his fight for the black man to new heights with a new urgency. And this ideology became known as black nationalism, a powerful philosophy which stuns America and the world in 1917. However, Garvey's place in history was and probably is still seen by many in the same light as John Brown, you know, a fanatic with a pipe dream. Just check out this scene from the film Cotton Comes to Harlem, and you can certainly see what I mean. He said, Dee, I want you to build a block yeah. and sail my people home. Oh. And there she is, yeah. Black Billy. Yeah. Are you black enough to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Garvey's Back to Africa movement was more of a figurative or spiritual journey. He believed that black was beautiful and that if the black man could reconnect his African roots, trust in a God that looked like him, become self-reliant again, then he could reclaim his place in the world and control his own destiny. Now from this premise for the equality of all men and the brotherhood of all men, the biblical injunction of Acts 17.26 reminds us that he created of one blood all nations of men that dwell on the face of the earth. I was most interested in brotherhood within his own race. Because if Negroes are created in God's image and Negroes are black, then God must in some sense be black. What I find fascinating about Garvey is how much this man accomplished during the times in which he lived. Think about it. You have the Great Migration, World War I, the Russian and Irish Revolutions, and the Harlem Renaissance all going on at the same time. So how does he motivate thousands of blacks to join his movement? Well, how would you feel if you were a soldier in a segregated unit fighting a war in Europe for someone else's freedom and return home to lynching, no jobs, discrimination? Ask the Harlem Hellfighters. How would you fight Jim Crow? sharecropping, lack of voting rights, poor schools, and the list can go on and on. Just ask your grandparents, for example, about the race riots, like the one in Rosewood and Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you will find your answer. Garvey's movement becomes destined to be the largest black organization in history because its ideology of black self-reliance and pride spreads into major cities in America and across the world. Even Philadelphia gets into the act. In fact, next to New York, Philadelphia, our city, had one of the largest followings of the Garvey movement. And believe it or not, it still exists and is going strong in Philadelphia today. Garvey's Unia and ACL still exist in our city today. Just take a walk like I did to Cecil B. Moore and 16th, or travel to 57th and West Gerard Avenues where the Garvey Foundation still meet, keeping his vision alive. Garvey even had a newspaper called The Negro World, which was published weekly. However, I am still in awe of his Black Star Line, a shipping company created to open trade with Africa and the world. In other words, it was commercially oriented. Get on board, country fun, get on board, lazy nun, get on board, country man, wine home on the Black Star Line. And run and owned by blacks. The Black Star Line was about racial and nautical pride. 
Garvey even created a song to go along with this Black Star line, and he sold shares to convince other blacks that black people were capable of owning and managing major business ventures. This shipping company raised over $600,000 before collapsing in 1922. He also started the Negro Factories Corporation, which developed grocery stores, restaurants, laundries, a moving van fleet, and a publishing house. Now we all know that when a brother is doing great things, there are those who decide that this cannot be, and Garvey's success in mobilizing blacks earned him the suspicion of the U.S. government, and it came under attack from many different directions. J. Edgar Hoover launches his assault, but Garvey stood his ground. Garvey did not only battle with white America. He also battled with members of black America like W.E.B. Du Bois, who felt that the Back to Africa program and black nationalism was diverting attention from the fight for justice here in America and disrupting its course. Was Garvey's Back to Africa movement the first of its kind? <laughs> the answer is no. All captured Africans on board slave ships like the Amistad fought to return home. Before Amistad, there was Paul Cuffey, the 18th century African who tried unsuccessfully to get the support of Philadelphians like Allen and Jones to sail back to Sierra Leone. Don't forget about the colonization societies led by powerful whites in government who were involved in sending blacks back to Africa. Remember Liberia, a country that was resettled by African Americans returning home? Check it out. In closing, Garvey predicted in 1937 that our chance will come when the smoke from the fire and ashes of the 20th century civilization is blown off. Was he correct? Was he a fanatic with a pipe dream? Just ask your parents and grandparents, or better yet, find that Afro wig and iron your dashikis and put on your Afrocentric earrings. A walk into any school during Black History Month filled with Garvey's colors of red, black, and green, and decide for yourself when you turn on the television and listen to President Obama as you contemplate the civil rights movement and Malcolm X. Will another movement like this ever form and take shape again in America? Has it ever really gone away? The answer is yes and no. It hasn't gone away. It is still with us, the spirit of Marcus Garvey, and racial pride, and being proud of who we are and where we come from, is still with us today. And now, back to Trudy. Ungawa, black power. Time for Shemaya Bay, the astrologer who's going to tell us what the stars have in store for us in this coming year. You're watching Astrology with Shemaya Bay on the Trudy Haynes Show. Welcome back, Happy New Year. Today we're going to be talking about Barack Obama. Um, this is January of 2013. He just was inaugurated. A couple questions came in. One was regarding why is his hair turning gray? Now I know this is norm not normally an astrological question, but we can um, apply some astrological knowledge with that. Barack Obama, our president, the 44th president to be exact, um, was born as a Leo in the time of uh, in the month of August during 1961. And right now, it's January of 2013. And what does that mean for his gray hair? Right now, the sun is in Aquarius. And Aquarius is the opposite of Leo. So oppositions tend to bump heads. As a result of that, that could be a contributing factor to the public and him and the, his constituents having some um, disagreements or major disagreements that is really stressing him out. So once again, I'm not, uh, what do you call, a person that deals with hair. I doesn't, do, do not work with a hair club of men. But I do know that gray hair is a contributing factor as a result of, now if it was not genetics, it's definitely stress related. And right now, any type of bill that um, President Barack Obama wanted to pass, he's going to find extreme opposition as a result of uh, several planets. One, Mercury, which deals with the communication, is in a sign of Aquarius. The sun is in the sign of Aquarius. And what does that mean? That means anything opposing 
you is telling you we you need to do it our way right now of uh, January 2013 we're dealing with gun control issues uh, we're dealing with uh, um, what they call Obamacare colloquialism so to speak and as a result of that we're dealing with more stress so once again going back to the off-camera question dealing with uh, President Barack Obama's gray hair we're dealing with stress from the public once again Aquarius rules humanity so once again humanity and we're dealing specifically in the United States of America and also feeling the pressure from other countries we're dealing with Iran uh, we're dealing with Israel and we're dealing with other nations not necessarily um, 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 broadcasted with the news so to speak and once again another off-camera question came in was regarding the weather right now um, the releasing of uh, the funds for Hurricane Sandy which hit, his, hit the eastern seaboard uh, some time ago uh, releasing that money has been di uh, very difficult and as a result of that something um, by it's alleged I put it that way um, you can do a Google search on it as well uh, isn't the internet wonderful and that leads me to the idea between now and June 26 of 2013 Jupiter will be in a sign of Gemini and what does that mean Jupiter is the planet of expansion and Gemini is the um, zodiac sign or the energy that deals with communication it deals with news could be from old-fashioned letter writing to we're dealing with the internet and emails or to text messaging so once again between now and um, June 26 of 2013 we're dealing with the idea of dealing with technology so what does that have to do with the weather so once again an off-camera question came in about the weather and what's happening we do I talked about Hurricane Sandy it's alleged that um, that may have been some type of eco-terrorism. I know that's a bad word and that's something that um, right now what's really interesting about that, my mind kind of went there, that that's one of the key searches for uh, allegedly by Homeland Security. And as a result of that, it's, uh, it's said that um, William S. Cohen, who used to be the uh, U.S. Secretary um, back in 1997, um, had gave a speech about um, eco-terrorism. For those who have no idea what I'm talking about, it's alleged that um, there are certain parties that have the ability to manipulate weather. I'll leave it at that and I'll allow you to do your own research. So back again, going back to astrology, we're dealing with the idea of in the summer of uh, after June 26 of 2013, we're going to be dealing with the grand trine. Trine is a triangle and a triangle is symbolic of things coming easy. It's a gift. It's a gift from the heavens and also is in the sign of water. Water signs are Pisces, can Cancer, and Scorpio. So Cancer, Pisces, and Scorpio, if you have the Sun, Moon, or your Ascendant in either of those signs, the summer of 2013 to 2014 is gonna be a really wonderful time for you. Um, we're coming to the close of this particular segment. I wanna um, have you keep in mind, tax season is here, so, um, be mindful of get them in uh, the right time in April, I believe it was April 15th. Also, I'm really looking forward to our guest. His name is Reverend Dr. Clifford E. Hazel. He's an exorcist. That's right, I said an exorcist. And what does that have to do with astrology? It has a lot to do with it. Um, with time that, I don't want to say ghost chasing, but this is an opportunity for you to discover the music of the spheres, and that's how the planetary bodies affect humans as well as the spiritual world. Once again, my name is Shemaya Bay. This is Astrology with Shemaya Bay on the Trudy Haynes Show. In the beginning, there was one gem. Then that one gem became four gems, which display beauty, class, style, and elegance. They are now Trudy's gems. Tori. Hi, I'm Tori Nicole. Music is my passion, singing is my love, writing is my therapy. As the 2012 Sparkle Singing Challenge winner in Philadelphia, I was given a great opportunity and platform to display my gift and talent to the world. I want to give you an opportunity to display your gift and talent well. Whether you sing, dance, play an instrument, you're a comedian, or have another talent, let me expose your gift to the world. You never know. You could just be next to be exposed. Sandra Kane and I work as a reporter for the Trudy Haynes Show. So basically it's me and my video camera taking on the world. Okay, 
So maybe not the whole world, maybe just Philadelphia. But I'm a graduate of Temple University and I majored in broadcasting, so I am so passionate about local news and stories that are unique to our community, Philadelphia. Local community-centered stories are what I'm passionate about and that's exactly what I want to help bring viewers at home. I'm super excited and I'm greatly honored to be one of Trudy's gems. I'm Ebony Washington, and I have spaz, spunk, and I provide top-notch news and entertainment for the Trudy Haynes Show. I graduated with a degree in broadcasting, and now my mission is to use it. Catch me if you can. Hello, this is Madam Q, the original stature of the catwalk. I'm 6'1", and I love fashion. I love the art of it. I love the silhouette and the color. Style. Here on the Trudy Haynes TV show, you will see me discussing accessories, footwear, wardrobe, the new trends, and of course, makeup and beauty. It's not what you wear, it's how you piece it together. The Trudy Haynes Show, coming soon, 2013, Trudy's Gems. Well, unfortunately, we have to go, but don't forget to join us every Thursday now at 5.30 p.m. And on Saturday mornings online, Life in Spirit at 9.30 a.m. So we have a choice to find us, don't lose us, and love us on Facebook and on YouTube. And remember, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Just remember, you could be the others. Have a blessed day.